All right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. This is Patrick Hall at Cancer Bridge. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be joined by Dr. Kristen Bird, uh, who is a PhD in molecular genetics uh, for the James Comprehensive Cancer Center at Ohio State uh, to discuss the latest in skin cancer research. I just kind of wanted to take a few minutes at the beginning of the presentation to talk about what Cancer Bridge is, uh, how to contact us, uh, and then talk about uh, some logistical uh, questions for the webinar itself. So uh, briefly, Cancer Bridge is a navigation service uh, provided by your employer uh, to provide you immediate one-on-one -on -one personalized access to a physician who is an expert in your specific type of cancer. So our goal is to provide you immediate expert guidance uh, at a time of great uncertainty. So what you and your family members uh, receive through Cancer Bridge is a physician or nurse or genetic counselor who's extremely knowledgeable and will listen uh, to whatever uh, issues you're facing. Again, we'll provide you rapid access to one of those experts. Again, that expert is going to be an expert in your specific cancer. Um, our experts will provide you guidance on next steps and avoiding mistakes uh, navigating the healthcare system. And we'll provide you immediate answers uh, during a kind of time of crisis. Another thing that we're striving to do is to provide resources like this, uh, webinars and general information beyond just cancer diagnosis questions, but also help with uh, genetic counseling, uh, nutrition, et cetera. So immediate family members are typically covered um, by your employer, and they include your parents, your parents-in-law, your spouse or partner, siblings, or children. Uh, so each of these individuals through the benefit that your employer provides would be eligible to contact the Cancer Bridge service. If you've got any questions about this and who is eligible, you can, of course, contact your HR team. Um, but briefly, Cancer Bridge is very simple. Your employee or, or uh, your family member calls into Cancer Bridge, uh, speaks to an oncology nurse who triages the call. So that nurse arranges a conversation with one of our cancer experts, and then our nurse will follow up uh, with you or your family member uh, within 24 hours to make sure any questions are asked or any questions that you have have been answered. You can contact the service uh, as many times as needed uh, throughout the cancer journey or anytime you've got questions about anything you or your family member are facing. So to learn more about Cancer Bridge, you can visit mycancerbridge.com or speak uh, directly to your HR team. Just uh, some logistics about the webinar itself. Uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Bird here in a second. But if you've got any questions that arise during her presentation, we ask that you ask them via the questions box in GoToWebinar or via email at questions at mycancerbridge.com uh, if you have any questions that come up after the presentation. So again, ask any questions that you have via the, the questions box. And then uh, at the end of Dr. Bird's presentation, we'll run through any of those questions. Uh, and to let you know if anything comes up, if you have to drop from the presentation, a recording of the webinar will be posted to YouTube in the next few days. You'll get an email of that recording, uh, and you can feel free to share that uh, with anyone else. So with that, I will go ahead and hand the presentation over to Dr. Kristen Bird, who is a PhD in molecular genetics at the James Comprehensive Cancer Center at Ohio State. She'll be talking about the latest in skin cancer research. Thanks, Dr. Bird, for joining us. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to tell you a little about our research today on skin cancer prevention, and specifically on sunscreens, and how we can use sunscreens to prevent many types of skin cancer. If I can get my slides to advance here. So just as a disclosure, I have no affiliations with any sunscreen companies. So all the information I will be providing to you is really unbiased um, opinion based upon the scientific literature and our own ongoing research. So today's seminar, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about different forms of skin cancer that we're trying to protect against using sunscreen. And then we'll talk about the current recommendations for sunscreen use um, from the American Academy of Dermatology, how sunscreens are labeled so that you can have a better idea of what to select when you go um, to purchase a sunscreen, 
some current controversies that have come up in the media concerning sunscreens and what, what are the facts about those particular controversies. I'll summarize a little bit about our findings and ongoing work here at the James, and then there'll be some time for you to ask questions. So I'm going to begin by just talking about briefly about skin cancer. There are two major forms of skin cancer that you'll hear about. Um, one is a grouping of skin cancers called non-melanoma skin cancers, and we'll talk more in depth about those on the next slide. And the other is melanoma itself. Non-melanoma skin cancers are by far the most common, um, commonly diagnosed cancer in the U.S. They're 3.3 million diagnoses per year of non-melanoma skin cancer. It's, it's an incredible number. Um, fortunately, most of these are caught early. They don't tend to metastasize. They tend to be localized. So as you can see here, the number of deaths is less than 2,000. And this continues to decline as we have better detection mechanisms and ways to treat these. Non-melanoma skin cancers are often occurring or found in sun-exposed areas. And this can be a concern because although I said these were frequently local, that means that um, the curative option for them, which is surgical rescission, can sometimes be disfiguring. So these are often occurring on the face, arms, body parts that are exposed to the sun. And so we really want to protect ourselves from these non-melanoma skin cancers because they do need to be treated and removed so they don't become something more aggressive. There are two major forms of non-melanoma skin cancers you'll see here. One is basal cell carcinoma. The other is squamous cell carcinoma. And they're just some representative images at the right. The other major form of skin cancer is melanoma. And you can see that compared to the 3.3 million um, non-melanoma skin cancers, there are far fewer melanoma diagnoses per year in the United States. However, the death rate is much higher from this disease. It is much more aggressive and much um, more of these tumors become metastatic. Fortunately, 96% of melanomas are caught when they are localized and can be surgically removed, which is great news. But it's important to keep in mind that even very small lesions, and sometimes even um, we see cases of melanoma that metastasize with no clear primary lesion. So it's very important to have a pathologist look at um, the mole that is resected um, to make sure that it is indeed localized and that the resection was curative. Most of you have probably heard of cutaneous melanoma or the skin-based melanoma that it's thought to arise mostly from moles, um, which you can see up here are some irregular moles that have become um, melanoma-like. Um, but there are also other forms of melanoma that you should be on the look for. One is acral melanoma. Uh, this can arise in the nail bed and frequently is characterized by a brown or black streak in the nail. It doesn't necessarily have to be as wide as the streak shown in this picture. But certainly, if you see a brown or black streak in your nail, it's worth having a dermatologist take a look at it to make sure it's not acral melanoma. Acral melanoma can also occur on the palms of the hands or on, your, on the bottoms of your feet, the soles of your feet. So another good place to look for um, potential lesions that could be caught early and removed. Another form of uh, melanoma is mucosal melanoma, which commonly occurs in the mouth and nose, but can occur in other um, areas that secrete mucus. So getting these areas looked at and any suspicious lesions um, investigated is, is really worth your time. And then the final form of melanoma that can occur actually um, arises from the pigmented cells in your iris. So this is a... Um, what's called a uvule or ocular melanoma. And so if you see a spot um, somewhere in your eye that seems to be evolving, definitely have an ophthalmologist take a look at that. So those are the major forms of skin cancer. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we can um, mitigate the, the probability that you get one of these sun cancers by using skin, sunscreen. And so what are the current recommendations for sunscreen, sunscreen usage? Well, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends that consumers 
choose their sunscreen with an SPF 30 or higher with the label broad spectrum uh, um, somewhere on the bottom and then also with a water resistance rating. And we'll talk more about how each one of these labels is determined in, in a little bit. But these are the current recommendations. The other thing that's come up recently is a lot of sunscreens have been incorporating other types of um, bug repellents and things into the sunscreen. It's not recommended that you use a sunscreen with a combination bug repellent because in order for a sunscreen to be really effective, you're going to need to reapply it frequently. And reapplying that bug repellent may cause some irritation to the skin. So just keep that in mind if you're going to be purchasing a, a sunscreen. It may be better to purchase a bug repellent separate from your sunscreen. So how should you pop properly apply sunscreen? There are a lot of different diagrams kind of trying to explain to you how much you should add. But I think this is one of my favorites. Um, essentially, you should apply sunscreen every two hours, which we talked about. Um, anytime you're doing a lot of um, activity, which would lead to sweating, if you're swimming, especially if you're toweling off after swimming, you should definitely reapply your sunscreen. Um, this is a great diagram because it shows um, essentially one teaspoon is equivalent to putting sunscreen on two of your fingers. And so one teaspoon should be used for the face, one for the front, one for the back of your torso, and so on. So it is a really good way of just measuring when you're out um, at the beach or at the pool. So when used properly, what have sunscreens actually been shown to do? Well, sunscreens have been shown by various literature to protect against squamous cell carcinoma, which is one form of non-melanoma skin cancer. And I put some references here, and I'll show you how you can get to those references at the end of the talk, just to show you that there are multiple references um, and literature demonstrating that squamous cell carcinoma can be properly um, mitigated with sunscreen. There is not much data concerning the risk of basal cell carcinoma being mitigated by sunscreen. So although there's more data to show that squamous cell carcinomas are prevented by sunscreen, there's very limited data right now um, as to whether basal cell carcinomas are also prevented. And that's another form of those non-melanoma skin cancers. When it comes to melanoma, it's been extremely hard to do studies um, looking at the efficacy of sunscreen. This is um, mostly because the studies have to be done such that there is a big enough population that actually um, is diagnosed with the disease after starting sunscreen usage. And so we don't have a, as many um, melanomas being diagnosed in the population percentage-wise as non-melanoma skin cancers. However, we know that melanoma risk is clearly associated with sunburns, especially during childhood. And so the fact that sunscreens protect against sunburns is a good indication that they're also protecting against melanoma. There have also been studies showing that sunscreens prevent new mole formation. And we know that the evolution of moles, how moles change on your skin, um, is predicted of, of future risk for melanoma. However, the actual um, evidence for decreased melanoma in incidence goes both ways. And so we don't have, like I said, we don't have great ways to test this in the human population currently, which is one of the challenges in really making the most effective sunscreen. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about sunscreen labeling. I told you kind of what the American Academy of Dermatology is recommending for usage, but what do all those labels actually mean? Well, those labels are determined by the FDA 2011 final rule, um, which establishes how sunscreens are labeled and tested. And so specifically it establishes rules regarding SPF rating or sun protection factor rating, water resistance. So in order to write water resistance on the bottle, there are certain specifications that have to be met and the labeling broad spectrum. So when we talk about sunscreens, we, we're thinking about how they protect us from sunlight and specifically from ultraviolet sunlight. There are three forms of ultraviolet sunlight that come from the sun, UVC, 
UVB and UVA. In general, we don't need to worry about UVC. UVC is trapped by the ozone layer, and we don't really experience any UVC here on Earth, other than in germicidal la lamps that are used to sterilize equipment, um, perhaps in uh, a medical setting. UVB and UVA, however, are more concerning. UVB um, is responsible for 80 to 90 percent of sunburns, and it has a pretty high energy wavelength, and is known to damage your genetic material or DNA. UVA, on the other hand, is much more abundant in sunlight, um, can penetrate the skin quite well, as you see here at the right, um, but is the lowest energy UV. So while it can promote damage, the damage it promotes takes a lot more um, UVA uh, to promote that damage. The concerning thing we know about UVA is it's used in tanning beds. And we know that there is a high risk for melanoma and other skin cancers that's associated with the use of tanning beds. So how is the sun protection factor determined according to the FDA 2011 final rule? Well, currently, um, Companies are required to do human skin testing of all sunscreen formulations. This involves 10 volunteers, and essentially what they're doing is testing how well this compound prevents burning. So they'll spread the sunscreen on one area of the back, and then they'll spread a test product or standard on another area of the back. And then they'll give the individual increasing doses of UVB light. And they only use UVB light in this current testing um, schema. And what they'll determine is 24 hours later, how much better, how much more UVB light could this individual experience before seeing evidence of a burn than when they were unprotected or didn't have sunscreen. So essentially, what SPF testing does is indicate how much longer you can be in the sun than if you went out without protection. And this may differ between individuals based on your skin type and your susceptibility to burning. However, SPF, it's important to know, does not take into account the damaging effects of UVA light. So SPF testing only measures UVB burning and not UV, any effects of UVA light. Not only that, but UVA light has been shown to be very important in photo aging of the skin. And so it doesn't really take into account the ability of a sunscreen to prevent photo aging. And so you'll notice that this test, the only thing it's doing is testing whether something can prevent burning. It's not testing whether something prevents skin cancer. And that's why the FDA has on every single label of sunscreen, every single bottle, it will say, if used as directed with other sun protection me measures, this product reduces the risk of skin cancer and early skin aging, as well as helps prevent sunburn. Because there's really no data currently in the testing for sunscreens that demonstrates their ability to prevent cancer. So what about the water resistance um, labeling that occurs on some of these sunscreens? Well, there are two classes um, from the FDA 2011 final rule of 40 or 80 minutes. And essentially, the testing for water resistance involves an individual placing the sunscreen on their back and then going into a climate-controlled pool area and doing moderate water activity for a period of either 40 or 80 minutes. Afterwards, that same SPF testing regimen is repeated to make sure that the um, rating is maintained. Now, you'll notice, though, from this that and during this process, the individual is not wiping off, toweling off, having kids hanging on them, things that we know will wipe off their sunscreen when, you, when it's wet. So it's important to keep in mind that water resistance really doesn't mean waterproof, and that's important to reapply, especially when going into the pool or at, being at the beach. The last label that is um, currently regulated by the FDA is the broad spectrum label, label. In order to pass broad spectrum testing, sunscreens have to undergo something called the critical wavelength test, 
essentially this is determining its ability to protect against UVA. We, we talked about how SPF determines UVB protection, but doesn't really measure UVA protection. And the critical wavelength test takes this place. Essentially what the critical wavelength test is, is that sunscreen is applied to a rough plastic. And the amount of UVA light that can pass through the plastic once the sunscreen is applied is measured. In order to achieve broad, a broad spectrum rating, a sunscreen must both, both have an SPF rating of 15 or higher, indicating that it protects against UVB, and it must block 90% of UVA rays passing through this particular plastic material. And so that essentially tells you, that broad spectrum label tells you that both UVA and UVB light is being blocked by the sunscreen. So now that we know a little bit about sunscreens, I think there have been a lot of controversies, especially recently in the media, and I wanted to kind of discuss what we know um, and what we don't know. So two of the controversies I wanted to discuss are, the first is that sunscreen SPF claims are inaccurate which has been kind of all over the news recently um, with consumer reports coming out with uh, this claim uh, for the second year in a row. And then some claims that sunscreens may cause infertility. And so what is the truth and, and what is the data out there? So we're going to start by the sunscreen's SPF claim might be inaccurate. And this is actually a figure from the consumer reports, um, report this year on sunscreens where they tested chemical and mineral sunscreens to determine whether they met their SPF claim after, um, after exposure to water. And what you can see here is that a large percentage of sunscreens did not meet their SPF claim in these testing. Now, the one thing I want you to keep in mind is you should be very wary of non-peer-reviewed laboratory tests. So when we test our sunscreens or we perform any kind of laboratory test, we then have these tests vetted and um, by other scientists in the field that have no particular interest in um, getting our, no particular bias in, in reviewing our research. And they carefully scrutinize how each test is done. And Consumer Reports doesn't really, and other of these uh, media uh, mechanisms don't really have that in place. However, this is concerning, um, certainly, that, that they're seeing this kind of um, product not, this, this percentage of product not working. Um, we do know that some screens must follow this FDA 2011 final rule. But remember that these tests are conducted in synthetic sunlight that's only UVB to get the SPF rating, that only 10 individuals are tested. So every individual may burn slightly differently, and 10 individuals may not be completely representative of the same individuals that Consumer Reports was looking at. Also, um, the FDA final rule does not require that aerosol or stick formulations of, with the same active components be retested. So if you think about when you're applying these, perhaps when you use an aerosol, which some of these sunscreens were in the consumer report um, testing, maybe you're not getting the coverage that you really need. Also, I wanted to point out that the SPF um, rating according to the FDA 2011 final rule, must just be lower, it only has to be lower than what the testing shows. So some companies may opt to add more active ingredients rather than test extensively. So their SPF 30 sunscreen may have as many active ingredients as an SPF 50 sunscreen. Um, why is this concerning to you? Well, for individuals who have allergies to specific components, you might think that if you buy an SPF 30 sunscreen, you're avoiding some of those extra components. But in truth, some of the companies will actually add in additional active ingredients to make sure they're constantly above that SPF rating. So you want to pay attention to how much of the active ingredients are in each tube of sunscreen that you buy. So in, to summarize kind of my thoughts on the, the claim that SPF um, are inaccurate, 
I think the rating systems for sunscreen could definitely be better, but companies are likely following the FDA rule appropriately. It's just that this rule doesn't really affect, um, doesn't really accurately predict what's going to happen in real life. So when we go out, we're not going into a controlled environment um, where we're not, um, you know, we're actively moving around and sunscreen can become rubbed off. We don't necessarily get the exact perfect coverage over our entire bodies. So I think the FDA final rule could be revised to make sunscreen testing a little bit better. What about this claim that sunscreens can cause infertility? That seems quite concerning. Well, we do know that components of sunscreen can mimic hormones in our body. This is, this is very well documented. And specifically, the components can mimic hormones in our body are benzophenones, um, also known as BP1, 2, 3, et cetera. Um, specifically, the one that probably is most concerning that you'll see in um, almost all American chemical sunscreens is oxybenzone. Oxybenzone, or BP3, is an estrogen-like compound, means like the female hormone, and that means it's anti um, the male hormone androgen. It's been detected in urine, serum, breast milk, water, and soil. So it's pretty much pervasive in the United States, and we know that it can be absorbed by individuals. There is some data that rats fed extremely high doses of oxybenzone, which would be equivalent to 277 years of daily sunscreen use show increased uterine weight, and so increased uterine weight is indicative of higher estrogen or female hormone levels. But similar correlations have not been shown in humans, and many different investigators have, investi have looked into this after this initial report. And it's important to keep in mind that of the oxybenzone that you're applying to your skin, only 0.5% of the active dose is actually able to penetrate. So for the most part, you're getting a very, very low dose, if any, of this environmental estrogen. And in fact, sunscreen might not be the major contributor to oxybenzone in our bodies. It may be coming through other sources like water, soil, and, and other things that we are exposed to in the environment. Um, the links with, um, of these benzophenones with infertility are somewhat limited. Um, there are some studies that suggest that exposure to specifically to benzophenone 2 is linked to reduced fertility only in men and not in women. Um, Almost all the associations who have tested all the all the tests for benzophenone have really brought benzophenone 2 um, to light as the one that may have an effect on male fertility. Um, however, a lot of these studies, as I mentioned, conclude that the benzophenone 2 may not be coming from sunscreens, but in fact from other products, um, many product products, cosmetics, um, shampoos contain benzophenone 2. Important to note that benzophenone 2 is not approved for use in sunscreens in the United States. So we will not see benzophenone 2 in any of our U.S. products, although BP3 is quite um, prevalent. So to summarize my thoughts on um, the fact that sunscreens may cause infertility, um, some chemical sunscreen components can act like hormones. It's very clear. But we have to remember that these are much, much less potent than normal hormones, and the, the topical absorption is very minimal. So really, the doses that you're receiving from the sunscreen are very, very low. Not only that, but only BC2 has been linked to reduce fertility. And there have been many studies on these benzophenones, especially in their use in sunscreen. So, it's important to note that the FDA has not approved the use of BP2 in the United States, so you won't see that here in your However, I want to mention, especially because um, this is Cancer Bridge, that chemical sunscreens are not recommended for children under two years of age where hormone levels are incredibly important and for individuals on a hormone therapy for cancer. So if you're receiving hormone cancer for, the, for your Hormone therapy for your cancer, 
it's recommended that either you use sun protective clothing, um, avoidance of, of sun, and especially at critical hours uh, midday, or that you choose a non-chemical sunscreen um, that's mineral-based. And um, that's based on the fact that it's so important that you regulate those hormones so that any even minute change may lead to some changes in the outcome of your therapy. So the truth about these controversies that have come up um, over the past couple of months is that while there may be some risk associated with using sunscreens, these are so minimal compared to the risk that you have by not using sunscreen. Um, you are clearly putting yourself at risk for skin cancer, um, and so it's very, very important that you continue to use these products. However, I think it's important that you understand the choices you have when you do go to purchase sunscreens so that you can protect yourself and so that you can limit exposure to compounds you don't want to be exposed to and so that you understand those labels on the sunscreen and can pick the best one for you. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our findings and ongoing work, which are trying to improve sunscreen and how well it um, protects us against specifically melanoma. So our research goals are four in part. The first is to determine how sun exposure puts you at risk for melanoma. And the next is to examine the ability of commercial sunscreen to protect against melanoma because that really isn't being done in the FDA testing. And then we want to provide information to help consumers select the best commercial sunscreens that will really protect them against this deadly cancer type. And then finally, we're here to assist in the development of improved sunscreens as um, new potential products are coming to the market. So the things that we've discovered so far have been using a model system. Um, these are mice that have moles, much like ours, that naturally progress to melanomas. So these mice develop spontaneous melanomas and have been well characterized. We know that if we give these mice just a little bit of sunlight, um, specifically UVB light, a non-burning dose, that they develop melanomas 80% faster than just if they were left alone in their cages. So just one single tanning dose of ultraviolet light is enough to trigger the initiation of melanomas in these mice. So that really um, kind of drives home the message of how important it is that every time you go out in the sun, you protect yourself. So again, even, even one suntan could put you at greater risk for melanoma. Um, we then went on to use this, these mice to essentially test some over-the-counter aerosol sunscreens. And what we did is just before we gave the tanning dose of UVB light to our mice, we sprayed the aerosol sunscreens on them um, to protect them against the UVB. We tested five different SPF 30 sunscreens and one SPF 50 sunscreen so far. And what our results show is that all sunscreens delay the onset of melanoma and prevent skin cell damage. So this was a very important discovery because really these sunscreens aren't being tested as to whether they can do this. So it's very exciting that the sunscreens are actually delaying melanoma. However, we did find that some SPF 30 sunscreens were better than others at protecting against melanoma. And one of the sunscreens we tested was 100% effective against pre preventing melanoma. So that was extremely exciting, but we wanted to know more about why there were differences between these ratings. And so we're currently undergoing many studies to understand the differences between our sunscreens. But one of the things that has very much come to light is that coverage may play an important role in how well a sunscreen works. So the aerosol sprays that we used, um, the amount of sunscreen that they applied was very variable, not only between sunscreens, but also within the same sunscreen from lot to lot, which is kind of scary because if you think about going out and buying your favorite sunscreen, it works really great the first time. You buy it again, and the you know, nozzle is not putting out as much coverage, you may get burned. So um, we think it's really important to be aware that, especially in these aerosolized sunscreens, you don't have a lot of control out of, over the coverage. And so you may need to actually use quite a bit of sunscreen before you get appropriate coverage. 
Right now, ongoing in the lab, we're trying to determine why some sunscreens outperform others. Are there specific components? Is it just coverage? Um, what specific things can we do to improve sunscreen? We also want to examine the protective effects of mineral sunscreens. Um, as you can see by the Consumer Reports um, diagram, a lot of the mineral sunscreens did not re um, re their, um, meet their SPF requirements. So we would like to examine those um, in our model as well. We'd like to better understand the role of UVA in melanoma. How important is it that we ha provide UVA protection? And then also, um, we want to help others develop new and improved sunscreens. And so we're reaching out to other investigators around the country who want to test their sunscreens and really find out if these are preventing cancer. I just wanted to mention that our research is funded by Pelotonia, and there's still time to join me and, and the 6,000 others as we ride in cancer coming up here in August. Um, this is incredibly important to have Pelotonia support as um, current funding mechanisms don't support research like this on sunscreens. So Pelotonia was instrumental in getting this going. And so now we have some time for questions, but I also want to to mention that um, you know, when you're looking for information on sunscreens and on melanoma, there are reliable and unreliable sources. And so I just wanted to point you to some of those reliable sources where scientists and physicians go to find information about sunscreen and about cancer. And so you can log on to any one of these sources and find a lot of reliable information that you can count on. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bird. Uh, it was an extremely informative presentation. We've got a number of questions that have come in. Uh, if you're ready to run through them, um, sure. A lot. We had a lot of inquiries, and you kind of touched on it at the end. But we had a lot of inquiries about the differences in efficacy between the, the lotion-based uh, sunscreen and the spray-on sunscreen. Um, yeah. One so that I would be able to help us with is just. How, how do you know how much you should use on the aerosol side? Yeah, it's very hard to determine um, because you can't determine the coverage and you can't, you know, do the two-finger rule. And so there's been a lot of movement to actually ban um, the production of aerosolized sunscreens. And back when the FDA made the 2011 rule, there was already some complaints about them because we talked about some of the... Um, potential um, hormone disrupting compounds that are in these. And if you can imagine spraying these, um, you could inhale those compounds and receive a much higher dose than if you were putting it on your skin. And so that was a major concern back in 2011 about the aerosols. But I think our data is really now pointing to the fact that it's not just important um, that we don't inhale these sunscreens, but also that we get appropriate coverage. And there's just no way to tell when you're using an aerosolized spray sunscreen. Okay. Thanks for, for clearing that up. Um, on one of your slides, you did have a mention that one sunscreen was 100% effective at preventing melanoma. Are you prepared to share which one that was? Yes. Yeah, so right now we are not sharing that information because we don't understand why that is. Um, yeah. And in fact, when we um, retested that sunscreen a different lot, again, we had problems with um, coverage. And it was definitely not equal to the first lot. And so those studies are ongoing to determine whether um, you know, from bottle to bottle, we may actually have different efficacy. So that's why we're we're really waiting to make recommendations. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, I kind of a lot of questions too around just the various types of sun sunscreen. Is there a natural sunscreen that is without chemicals? I, I suppose that would be maybe purely mineral based. Yes. So there are several mineral based um, sunscreens out there. So the difference between a chemical and a mineral-based sunscreen is a chemical-based sunscreen, what it does is it's actually going to absorb the UVB that's coming and hitting your skin. The mineral-based sunscreens, they're designed to reflect the, the UV light off of your skin. And so essentially what they're doing is reflecting all of those rays off of your skin. 
And you'll see they contain usually zinc oxide um, or, or other um, kind of metal compounds that will reflect this. The, the thing about mineral sunscreens is the, while they may all contain, you know, 10% zinc oxide, the formulation of that zinc is incredibly important. So how small the particles of zinc are determines how well they reflect the light. And it's very hard to know when you buy a bottle of mineral sunscreen how it's been formulated. There's no information on the packaging. And so I think that's one of the challenges in, in kind of purchasing one of these, unless you know that that one has really good reflective capabilities um, from personal experience, how do you choose one? And so that's why we're hoping to go forward and begin to test some of these um, to really determine kind of what the perfect particle size is of these mineral sunscreens to provide the best protection for, for you and then recommend brands that have those specific particle sizes. Okay, great. Uh, we've had a couple questions about your slide that had the, the one teaspoon of sunscreen for each area of your body. I, I mm -hmm. think people found that to be really, yeah, if you could come back to that. I, I think people yeah. found that really... Uh, enlightening, if you could just review that again with everybody. Yeah. So a lot of times people are told, um, let's see how we get back, um, to use one shot glass full of um, sunscreen for your whole body, but I find that too hard to figure out where should it go. So I like this um, kind of two finger model where essentially if you if you apply sunscreen down two of your fingers, that represents one teaspoon. Okay, and then one teaspoon for your face and neck, one teaspoon for your torso, one teaspoon for your back, and then kind of each kind of one foot area along your body needs two fingers of sunscreen. I think that's just a much easier way to kind of figure out how much you need um, and easy way to remember how much you need because the major problem with sunscreen is we're not applying enough and we see that that is incredibly critical in our our models and testing in the lab. Okay, great. I think that I'm trying to run through any of the questions we had around specifics. Um, so there was there is a question around various brands causing allergic reactions. Um, are you aware of any specific ingredients in sunscreens that can that can induce uh, an allergic reaction? On one versus another, and anything you've come across? Yes, yeah, so certainly there are um, components, and it, it can be different components that people are allergic to within the sunscreen. So I would say on the back of every sunscreen are the components that are listed and their percentages. Um, if you have an allergic reaction to a sunscreen, I would definitely pay attention to what those components are um, and try to select something that may have less of a specific component. Or you can try to go to a mineral sunscreen. Um, just be aware that it might take some testing before you find one that works really great for you. Um, perhaps ask your dermatologist if they recommend a specific brand. Um, oftentimes, dermatologists can give you an idea of what you might be allergic to and some alternatives. Okay, good. And then, you know, maybe just some clarification around terminology that people see. In the, in the marketing language, is, is there a, effectively a difference between sunscreen and sunblock? Yeah, so really sunblock and sunscreen are the same thing. Um, it's just marketing. Um, ne neither one of them will filter out all UVB rays. Um, essentially, the, the only thing that will do a great job at preventing UVB are clothing and shade. <laughs> So um, we know that that's probably the safest way to protect yourself, but really sunblock and sunscreen are, are not regulated by the FDA, so they, they can be used interchangeably. Okay. Um, this next question kind of dovetails on what you're saying about clothing. We're starting to see a lot of advertisement on clothing, you know, like, uh, just like distinguishing the, the UV protective amount on clothing. Is that... Is there any research around that? Is like one type of clothing really more effective at blocking radiation versus another? 
Um, so I think what I would say regarding clothing is all clothing has an SPF rating, um, but right. some, you know, it's whether they want to test the SPF and actually label it as such. But even, you know, your old T-shirt has good SPF protection. So don't be, you know, afraid to buy, you know, to just wear an old T-shirt um, as protection or, you know, anything like that. Um, all clothing has an SPF. It's just not necessarily tested to be rated as such. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I, I like that there are things being distributed that explain to consumers that clothing has an SPF rating, but, you know, any kind of clothing will have some SPF to it, and it just kind of depends on how much sunlight can pass through it. So if it's a tighter weave versus a, a looser weave in the material, um, how much is actually coming through. So those SPF rated clothing actually have been tested and shown to have that SPF, whereas, you know, a t-shirt that you grab off the shelf may have, it has some SPF, but what exactly it is, is not clear. It's still going to be a lot more than the majority of sunscreens you have out there. Great. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question here. If you already have metastatic melanoma, does sunscreen provide any value? Of course. Um, you know, if you are diagnosed with metastatic melanoma, your chances of getting even a secondary lesion are much higher. So anyone diagnosed with melanoma or skin cancer, their chances of being diagnosed again are higher. So you do not want a secondary lesion. Um, every single melanoma is different, so it evolves differently, and it, it, its resistance to treatment would be different. So you really want to stick with the one you have and not get any additional lesions. Okay. Um. I have a number of questions around melanoma uh, itself, so maybe we can kind of shift to those. Um, have, do you know if there's been any research regarding if melanoma can be passed to children, if, if it's hereditary or not? And that, that might be out of your, your research area. But that's one of the questions. So there are genetic, um, there are certain genetic lesions that occur in the germline, so that can be passed to your children, um, that would make your family more susceptible to both melanoma and pancreatic cancer. So if you have um, individuals in your family who have had been diagnosed with melanoma, or if you have a large number of moles, um, it's, it's important to seek genetic counseling um, because there may be a higher risk for your children. So it, it is important um, to have this assessed because there is a small percentage of, of individuals who have what we call familial melanoma, which is caused by a genetic mutation that's passed on to your children. But if you have melanoma yourself and you know no, no one else in your family has ever had melanoma, um, it's probably not a case of familial melanoma. Yeah. No, and I would say too that's kind of a perfect question to, to call in a cancer bridge with. Um, you know, you can call in a cancer bridge, uh, and we can arrange a conversation to kind of talk through the specifics uh, with a genetic counselor or a, a skin cancer physician as well. So, I'd, you know, whoever asked that question, I'd recommend making that call. Um, one of our, I think we have a couple questions around the pictures that you were showing and the various types of skin cancer. Is, is there a website that you'd recommend that kind of runs through um, some of those pictures in detail? Was that maybe on your, or the resources for, for kind of self-examination on your, on your last slide there? Or would you recommend just speaking? Uh, yes. If you've got any. Um, well, it's, it's very challenging to actually self-diagnose, um, but I would really suggest of, I'm going to go to the end here, um, of the resources I have here um, to kind of examine your own mold, I would really suggest the American Cancer Society um, as one place to look, as well as the American Academy of Dermatology. So online they have information um, on what an abnormal mole looks like, um, 
what these types of cancers typically look like. They discuss kind of um, various attributes that you might notice in these cancers, um, how frequently you should be screened for them, and, and best practices for prevention. And I also think we have a link to that on our own James website. Um, just to let everybody know, too, we will send out copies of these slides. There's been a, a number of, of questions that have been asked around that, so we will be sure to send out a, a PDF of, of Dr. Bird's slides here as well. Um, a couple of questions have come in around, um, I'm not sure the proper term, but the, the spray tanning or the, the bronzers. Uh, are there any concerns or dangers with, with using those types of products that you've come across? Well, I mean, these are chemicals, again, that you're applying to your skin, and I'm not sure we understand completely um, what the effects are. They're certainly not linked with melanoma at this time, and um, I was just on the American Academy of Dermatology's page, and one of their suggestions was if you really want to be tan and you, you can't let that go, you can use a bronzer or a tanner. Um, rather than go out to the UV light. It's safer right. to do that than to suntan. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I think we can wrap up with this last question. Uh, as, a, as a person's kind of going through their, you know, their, their standard medical examinations, you know, a dentist, uh, for example, regularly checks for melanoma. Um, do you know if an optometrist is generally looking for melanoma during regular eye exams? For sure, yes. Yeah. They definitely are. So they, they will take a look. But if you have any signs of, you know, changes in the color of the pigmentation of your eye, definitely have an optometrist, optometrist check this out. Um, you know, uveal melanoma is rare, but it does occur. And um, it's important to get it looked at early. Okay. I appreciate that. And then this last question uh, is one for me as well, because I suffer from this problem chronically. Um, do you have any tips on how to apply sunblock to your face to prevent uh, dripping into your eye? Um, I suffer from this. Apparently, I suffer from this, right? You you apply sunscreen to your forehead, you sweat, and it just runs right into your into your eyes, kind of causing a lot of irritation. Have you you heard anything there that you know, have any tips or tricks mm -hmm. there that may help people like us? Yes, yes. I mean. As, as a mom of a six-year-old, uh, I very much know I very much know this um, pain. Uh, you know what I found is that it's kind of trial and error as far as the formulation of the sunscreen. So you may want to be selecting something that has a water resistance rating of 80 minutes and not 40 minutes, um, so that it's really not kind of dripping off of you. Um, you also might want to try different application methods. Certainly, we do not recommend using aerosols anywhere near your face because we don't want to inhale sunscreen. It's not meant to be inhaled. It's meant to be topically applied. So, um, but sticks are certainly an option, sunscreen sticks. Um, and some of these sunscreens that have the higher water sweat proof um, ratings, I, I would try some of those out. Um, and see if you can get some of those to work a little bit better. Okay. Well, appreciate the the advice there. Well, I think this was a this was a great presentation. We had we had so much uh, so many questions come through. Uh, so I think that really speaks to the uh, to the level of interest that the audience had. I think everybody really appreciates your time, uh, and we want to thank you again for making yourself available to Cancer Bridge to to run through this critical research and and answer these questions. We'll be distributing a recording of the presentation out to all attendees. So if you'd like to share that with any coworkers who could not make it, please feel free. And as we said earlier, we'll be distributing uh, slides as well. Um, and if you do have any other questions that come up after this presentation, you can reach out to our email address, which is questions at mycancerbridge.com. Uh, I'll try to get those addressed as well. So again, thanks, Dr. Bird, for all of your time. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you all. For joining. Have a great day.